BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of his word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be his disciples and after his death and resurrection those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now after 2,000 years Beth Goyim Messianic congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to the book of Shemot, Exodus chapter 18, please. Shemot, Exodus chapter 18, where you're, this is message P070, the 70th tape message. Oh my goodness. Wow, it's amazing, 70. Well, this is the 70th tape one. I think there was a few other ones, so it might be almost 80. Uh, this is Parash number 17. It is called Jethro. Jethro, okay, it's from Shemot. Chapter 18, verse 1 through 20, verse 23. Let us start with uh, verse 1. Now Yitro was a priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law, heard about all that God had done for Moshe and for Yisrael, his people, how Adonai had brought Yisrael out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. Amen? So here, the fame of the Lord, Jehovah, was spreading throughout the biblical lands, okay? As he said would occur, um, he won glory for himself. So here is a priest of Midian. Now remember, there, there are other cultures throughout the globe. Um, and if you want to learn about them, actually a, a tremendous book that's out now is by a man named Victor Schlatter. I recommend everybody get this book, okay? That God had sent his people out even prior to Mitzrayim, even prior to the, the, the captivity of the slavery of Egypt. He had sent them around the globe, and um, it's very fascinating. So here, uh, Yitro, who was a priest of Midian, now the Midianites were uh, monotheistic in their theology. They were not, you know, worshiping 30,000 different gods. Like, you know, you go to India, there's a thousand gods. Okay, so here he had heard about the... King of kings, the Lord of lords. He had heard this. He had heard about the fame, and he had heard about how Jehovah had brought the people of Israel out of Mitzrayim. Okay? Um, let us now look at verse 2. After Moshe had sent away his wife, Zipporah, and her two sons, he chose Moshe's father-in-law, had taken them back. Now, I'm going to read you in the NASB, which reads a little bit closer to the Hebrew, a little bit better of a translation here, closer to the Ivrit, the Hebrew. Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, took Mo Moshe's wife Zipporah after he had sent her away. So Moshe, now, you got to give him a, you know, a lot of credit, a lot of, you know, he, he was doing something that had never been done before. Okay, he didn't go, be able to, he wasn't able to turn to chapter 19 and go, okay, what happens next? So Moshe sent his wife away and his children in a way because he was dealing with all this, this new stuff. He was dealing with the people. He was dealing with, um, with training them and stuff like that. Now, leadership. Now, this has a lot to do with leadership. Men are going to be men, okay? And Moshe, even though he was over 80 years old when, when this was happening, now we know that uh, the Jewish men, prior to the drugs that we have today, were still procreating, you know, Abraham had six more children at the age of 120, okay? And this was prior to, you know, Viagra and all the other silly stuff that's out there, right? Okay? So Moshe sent his wife away. When you're in ministry, okay, even 
though it's difficult. Men that are in ministry, do not send your family away. Do not. You have to spend time with your family, okay? Because if not, as we see recently, there's been a lot of pretty big ministers falling into fornication, into drugs, into prostitution, because they do not spend time with their family. You have to, okay? Remember, it's God's ministry. You're just the, the shamashin. You're the servant of the ministry. And as leaders in the, in the globe, if you're married, you need to do your hours at ministry or do your work, come home, spend your time with your family, and then maybe go back to the congregation, okay? So Moisha had sent away his wife and his two sons. So here the father-in-law is going, I'm going to go talk to my son-in-law. You know, I gave you her. Take her. I don't want her back now. <laughs> He's saying, you know, remember, Zipporah, you know, cut the foreskin off of one of the kids there. You know, she's, you know, the, he, he thought he got rid of her, but here she's back now. So <laughs> Moshe was saying, you know, you need to take her, you know, his father-in-law, who is wiser. And the other thing that, one of the things you can look at is Yitro was a priest of Midian. Okay? He was older than Moshe, being that, you know, his daughter was given to Moshe. Yitro's daughter was given to Moshe. Okay? So he may have been able to give some counseling, but always remember, especially if somebody's not serving the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, that, that, that stuff you get from other people, you know, make sure you always test it against the word of Jehovah, okay? So here, let's now look at verse 3 and 4. The name of the one son was Gershom, for Moshe had said, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Name of the other was Eleazar, because God of my father helped me by rescuing me from Pharaoh's sword. Amen? So here you can see by the names of his two children, you could see that Moshe felt a little homesick for his people, okay? So he was being alone. And that's always, it's tough on everybody, one, especially like nowadays. You're, you're, you've left the, the, the Sunday church because you, you realize that the fourth commandment is the fourth commandment. And then you're trying to talk to your family, and they don't want to follow the Torah, right? And you're trying, and then, you know, they say, well, why don't you guys come over for dinner? And then you're there, and you've you got nothing to talk about, right? Because, you know, you don't watch the same television shows. You know, your, your mind is focused all about prophecy and about what's going on in the world and praying for the peace of Israel. And, you know, so here you can see that you're not alone because Moshe, son, his first son, or at least the first one that's mentioned here, um, a foreigner in a foreign land. Okay? So here it is. He, he's like, you know, he's feeling a little lost. Okay? You can tell it by the names. A foreigner in a foreign land. And then the second son that's mentioned here, Eleazar, my God helps. You can see that Moshe was starting to, you know, his walk was coming back closer with the Lord. That he realizes that there's a reason for everything. Okay? There's a reason for everything. But here, his two sons and Zipporah, okay, is coming on back. Because the father is like, the father-in-law is like, you know what, Moses, you got to take your, daughter, your wife back or something good's not going to happen, okay? Now let's look at verse 5. Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought Moshe, sons and wife to him in the desert where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Amen? So here it is. His father-in-law says, hey, I gave you my daughter. I don't want her back. You better take her back. No, no, he's not doing New York. He's saying, you're a family. Ministry is good, but remember, your first ministry is to your family. And then, if that's good, then everything else will be good. I know, understand you're called by God, but God will not split apart families, okay? Unless you're unevenly yoked, then it's a different story, because Yeshua talks about that, okay? If you're unevenly yoked, but God called both of them, because remember, Zipporah knew the Lord, because remember when Moshe's riding a donkey back to Egypt a little while ago, you know, the angel of God was going to kill Moshe, and she, well, you know, circumcised the son. Okay? So here, they're encamped by the mountain of God. Well, what is this mountain of God? Let's take, let's take a little ride through the scripture here about to find out where this mountain of God is. Okay? Because it's important, because Moshe, 
who's had a close relationship with the Lord, he should have prayed to God. Or, you know, when you read the scriptures, what I love most about Moshe, you see he's got this special relationship that not many people have. That Jehovah talks to him like a friend. They have conversations. So I understand Moshe wanting to send his wife away because he's not spending time with her. Okay? But he should have asked Jehovah, uh, what about my family? What should I do? How, how does this work? Ask the boss. So here, they're even at the mountain of God. Well, what is this mountain of God? Well, turn back to Shemot chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 1. We're going to get a, a little look at the diamond to know where they're camped, okay? Just so you can have some reference points to build your knowledge, to you know, add some more work to your foundation there, okay? Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moshe was tending the sheep of Yitro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, leading the flock to the far side of the desert. He came to the mountain of God to Horeb. Okay? Amen? So here it was. Now this mountain of God we know is in the, the biblical lands of Horeb. Okay? Moshe met Jehovah there because he remember he brought the sheep to the far side there and he went over to see the bush that was burning but it wasn't being burned up. Okay, so we have one look at the mountain of God. Now turn to Shemot 19, verse 9 through 11. Shemot 19, Exodus 19, verse 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Shemot 19, verse 9 through 11. And I said to Moshe, see I'm coming to you in a thick cloud so that the people will be able to see able to hear when I speak with you and also to trust in you forever. Moshe had told Adonai what the people had said. So Adonai said to Moshe, go to the people today and tomorrow, separate them for me by having them wash their clothing and prepare for the third day. For on the third day, Adonai will come down on Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. Amen. So here it was, or, you know, at this mountain. Now we know that it's the mountains in Horeb. And now we know the mountain of God is also called Har Sinai, the mountain of Sinai, okay? So we have the two references. And then third reference, if you want to turn to Shemot 24, verse 15 through 18, Shemot 24, verse 15 through 18. Moshe went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Adonai stayed on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days on the seventh day. He called to Moshe out of the cloud to the people of Israel that the glory of Adonai looked like a raging fire on top of the mountain. Moshe entered the cloud and went up to the mountain. He was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Amen? So you see that this third reference here is also the mountain of God. Moshe stayed there, you know, took a vacation 40 days and 40 nights, you know, away from all these people, get his head on straight. No, no. He, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights also. Um, the glory of the Lord came down on this mountain, so this would be that mountain of God. Now turn back to Exodus chapter 18, verse 6 and 7. We're also in this particular teaching tonight. We're going to get to the Ten Commandments. We're going to read them in Hebrew, and we're also going to get... Huh? Did you? Well, you should. Uh, we're going to send you another PowerPoint. Oni, so you'll have the Ten Commandments in Hebrew and transliteration. All right. Shemot 18, verse 6 and 7. He sent word to Moshe, I, your father-in-law Yitro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law, prostrated himself, and kissed him. Then, after inquiring of each other's welfare, they entered the tent. Amen? So here, the word prostrated is Shekha, Shekha, that's spelled S-H-A-C-H-A-H. That's S-H-A-C-H-A-H. It means to bow down. So Moshe, it means to bow down, to depress, to prostrate oneself uh, to one who's elevated above you. Okay? So here, what Moshe was doing, just want to get a drink here, um, was paying respect to his father-in-law, Yitro, okay? And so he bows down. I know there's a lot of, you know, evangelical churches and a lot of other 
uh, Christian denominations where people fall backwards. Uh, we never see that in Scripture. In reverence to the Lord, okay? And also in reverence to somebody who's elevated above you. Okay, Moshe was showing respect to his father-in-law, as, you know, the commandments, as we'll read later. Okay, he bowed down. He did not fall backwards. Falling backwards is not showing respect. Bowing down before the Lord, putting your face to the dirt, totally being submissive to the Lord, that's what shikha means, is being submissive. Okay, now going on to verse 8, Moshe told his father-in-law, all that Adonai had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, for all the hardships they had suffered while traveling and how Adonai had rescued them. Amen? So here it was, Moshe was testifying of what Jehovah did for them. This is what we should all be doing. If God is doing something for you, you should testify. Okay, you should sing his praises. You should let other people know about it. Also, Moshe said he told them about hardships. Okay, now this is also something that we should testify to so that people don't think, you know, walking with the Lord is all like, you know, peachy keen, it's perfect, and everything's always going to be, you know, roses and everything with the Lord. No, sometimes it's a rough road because the Lord is having you trust in him more. If everything is always easy, then you will not trust as deeply. Okay? The more things sometimes go seemingly go wrong, the more it is that the Lord is asking you to trust him. Now we see two words here with that understanding. We're going to first focus on the word hardships. Okay? That the Lord did have them have hardships. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 14. Acts, chapter 14, verse 21 through 23. Acts, chapter 14, verse 21 through 23. Acts, chapter 14, verse 21 through 23. Acts, chapter 14, verse 21 to 23. We're going to look at the, we're going to focus on the word hardship. Now, you understand the Hebraic meaning that everything with the Lord is not always perfect. That you, you, sell, you have to celebrate the good things and you have to celebrate the bad things too. But they are called hardships. After pro proclaiming the good news in that city and making many people into Talmudim, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the Talmudim, encouraging them to remain true to the faith and reminding them that it is through many hardships that we must enter the kingdom of God. After appointing elders for them in every congregation, Shaul and Barnabah, with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Amen? So here, if we focus on verse 22, Shaul says that through many hardships, you must, you will enter the kingdom of God, okay? So through a lot of hardships, we will go through because the Lord is testing us. Testing is good. How many people like to go through tests? Everybody like to go through tests? Oh, it's awesome. I love tests, okay? Not many people like to go through tests, but to get to the kingdom and to get that crown, to win the race, you have to pass many tests. You have to work towards the goal. You must Prove yourself. You must trust in the Lord. So here it is that this hardship that Shaul is talking about, if you understand the original part of Exodus 18, verse 8, hardships coming out of Mitzrayim, trusting in the Lord when Pharaoh's army was bearing down at you, walking through the Reed Sea with 3,000 feet of water on either side of you, walking in the desert three days and there's no water and you got all these people crying and my feet are tired and, you know, it was easier to be a slave. Hardships. But hardships, what we understand here now, that we may enter the kingdom of God. Now, let's, in, in Shemot 18.8, we looked at also the word that the Lord rescued us. So turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 
2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 6 and 7. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Everybody got it over there? All right. And he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, reducing them into ashes and ruin as a warning to those in the future who would live ungodly lives. But, res but he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the debauchery of those unprincipled people. Amen? So here, the two angels, as we remember from Genesis 18, they came to Sodom and Gomorrah and they rescued Lot. Okay? They rescued Lot. So here, how Moshe is telling Yitro, his father-in-law, that, that they were rescued by the hand of the Lord, okay, from unprincipled people, okay? If you don't have the Lord, if you don't have the Bible, if you're not following the word of Jehovah, then you'll have man-made rules, and what's good in the Philippines might be one thing, what's good in England might be another thing, what's good in Australia might be a thing. There's all different rules. It all depends what the person who's ever in charge at the moment. The strongest person wins. But if we all follow God's way, then we will be rescued, okay? So you have a promise of being rescued, and that's also there in 2 Peter. Now let's turn back to Shemot chapter 18, please. Shemot chapter 18. We're going to look at verse 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Shemot 18, verse 9 through 11. Yitzhak rejoiced over all the good that Adonai had done for Israel by rescuing them from the Egyptians. Yitro said... Blessed be Jehovah, who has rescued you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh, who has rescued you, rescued the people from the harsh hand of the Egyptians. Now I know Jehovah is greater than all other gods because he rescued those who were treated so arrogantly. Amen? So we're going to focus there on verse 11, that Jehovah is greater than all other gods. Now remember, who's saying this is Yitro. He's a priest of Midian. So he has some sort of understanding on, on you know, religious things or gods of the world. You know, we have no idea how long he was, was doing this priesthood or you know, that whole understanding or what his job totally encompassed. But he knows about other gods. He knows about the God he serves. And now he's really understanding about Yehovah, and that's what it says there, where it says Adonai, that in the Hebrew is Yehovah, yod heh vav -Hey. Okay? So here it is that Yehovah is greater than all the other gods. Okay? Now that's important to understand because now we're going to turn and we're going to have, with that Hebraic roots understanding, we're going to take that word greater and turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. You might want to underline this. In your scriptures, so if you ever meet up with a demon, here is your script that you read to the demon. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. And it does work, okay? Personal knowledge, okay? 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. Here's how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit with it, which acknowledges that Yeshua the Messiah came as a human being is from God. Every spirit which does not acknowledge Yeshua is not from God. In fact, this is a spirit of the anti-Messiah. You have heard that he is coming. Well, he is here now in the world already. You children are from God and have overcome the false prophet because he who is in you is greater than than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God doesn't listen to us. This is how we distinguish the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. Okay, amen? So there you see in verse 4 that who lives in you is greater 
than he that lives in the world. And if you ever come up to a demon and you say to the demon, do you believe that Yeshua came in the flesh, that Yeshua is from the Father, and that he is Messiah? These are the questions that you talk to the, the demon about. Here's your script to whether or not to know if the demon is of God or not of God. Okay, you got to see if that demon is a demon or somebody from the Lord. Okay, so here these are criteria that you need to follow, questions that you need to ask. But here, knowing the Hebrew roots of Shemot 18, verse 11, Adonai is greater than all other gods. Now you then take it to 1 John, the disciple who walked with Yeshua. 1 John 4, 4, greater is uh, he that is in you than he that is in the world. So the word greater, you tie the two together, because even Yitro was seeing that our God was better. Okay, turning back to Shemot 18. Shemot 18, let's see here. Uh, verse uh, 13, verse 13. The following day, Moshe sat to settle disputes for the people while the people stood around Moshe from morning till evening. Amen? So the word dispute here is shafat. That's S-H-A-P-H-A-T. S-H-A-P-H-A-T. It means to judge, govern, Vindicate or punish. Say that again. Judge, govern, vindicate or punish. So here Moshe is sitting there day and night, all day long, morning till evening. That's why he sent his wife away, teaching people the Torah of God. Okay? Now, this job can get to be very difficult, especially when people, you know, you're trying to get the answer's out of people, and they're playing a game, and you're trying to discern what's going on, and you have to seek the Lord. So here it is. Moshe was doing this whole thing, and sitting there from day to night because he thought he was the only one, okay? And he was at this point. God had not raised up another person, nor had he, you know, told Moshe to go get other people, okay? Uh, verse 14, 14 through 16 when well, Moshe's father-in-law saw all that he was doing to the people, he said, What is this that you're doing to the people? Why do you sit here, there alone with all the people standing around you from morning till evening? Moshe answered his father-in-law, It's because the people come to me seeking God's guidance. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me. I judge between one person and another and explain to them God's laws and teachings. Amen? This is the job of a Shamashim. This is the job of the rabbi. Okay? We know later on that Moshe is not a Kohen. His brother Aaron is a Kohen. So here, the teacher, Moshe, is teaching them God's laws and rulings. Some people call it a moray, but it's the rabbi. The rabbi is the one who's teaching the people what is right in God. Okay? Now, here is a very interesting part. We'll do 17 through 20. 18, chapter 18, verse 17 through 20. Moshe's father-in-law said to him, What you are doing isn't good. You will certainly wear yourself out. And not only yourself, but these people here with you as well. It's too much for you. You can't do it alone by yourself. So listen now to what I have to say. I will give you some advice, and God will be with you. You should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases to God. He should also teach them the laws and the teachings and show them how to live their lives and what work they should do. Verse 21, we're going to keep going. But you should choose from among all the people competent men who are God-fearing, honest and incorruptible, to be their leaders in charge of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Amen? So here... Now, Moshe is paying attention to his father-in-law, is respectful. He's a priest of Midian. He's getting this seemingly good advice. Now, Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to the Remnants Call each and every week. 
You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnant's Call. Now, when you get good advice, what is the first thing that you should do? You know, you got this guy, well, he's a pagan. Now, remember... Yitro's a pagan, okay? He's not of the promise. He's a priest of Midian, not serving the God of, God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He's serving a dear... He may be thinking he's serving the Lord, but he's not, okay? Moshe is doing that. So you get this advice. Now, Moshe has a very good relationship with the Father. So what should Moshe have done? Say, that's great. Information, that's good, good uh, things you want to tell me here, but I'm going to first take that in prayer. I'm going to take it. I'm going to go in the tent. I'm going to seek the Father and see if that's what He wants me to do. Okay? This is what we should all do. Whenever somebody comes to you, if you don't know them well, always, and even if you do don't know them well, seek God first. Seek the kingdom. See if it matches up with Scripture. Now, Does this match up with Scripture? Not at this point. Okay? Competent men. You know, in verse 21, Yitro says competent men. How do you know they're competent? Moshe has maybe known them for a few months, if that. Okay? So how do you know they're competent? How do you know they're competent in the law of God? It's going to take a couple years before these people are. So Moshe made an error here because he did not seek the Lord. And this is what we see with some of the things throughout the trials that go through the desert is because the leader should have sought God to see if that was the answer, should have lined up with Scripture. You're getting a pagan person to give you this information. All right? So that's the part about leadership. Now we want to move on. I'm going a little quick now, but I want to get this in in the next 20 minutes, okay? Let's turn now to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, hopefully you've had a chance to download the PowerPoint. In Exodus 20, the people of Israel have come to the mountain of the Lord, and the Lord separated them for three days. Now, it wasn't just Israel, it was a mixed multitude that was there. So both Jew and Gentile were there. Now, here, the Lord is going to speak with them. We're going to break this down. We're going to read it in Ivrit, in Hebrew. We're going to read it in English, and then... We're going to read it in Hebrew, okay? Because once you read it in Hebrew, it is a lot more powerful, these Ten Commandments. A lot more powerful. Okay? Now let's do verse 1 and 2. Then God said all these words. This is uh, Shemot chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. Then God said... You're at a carnival. No. Then God said all these words... I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. Amen? Now, that, that's a pretty good translation, okay? But let's look at each word in the Ivrit, in the Hebrew, because once you see that, it tends to take a much stronger look at the word. It is a much more powerful understanding to what is being said here. In the Hebrew, in the Ivrit, it says, Anochi Yehovah Elochecha. And I'll say that again. Anochi Yehovah Elochecha. Okay? It says, I am Yehovah, God of you. Okay? So what this is saying is he is showing ownership ownership of the people who are in 
the desert, that are at the mountain, he is saying, I am the God of you. That means he is saying, you are my possession. I own you. If you accept the terms to this contract, I will be your king. You will be blessed. But here, the very first commandment, Anochi Yehovah Elohecha, okay? It is, he is showing this deep ownership for his possession. Now, you know, when you read it in the English, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. It doesn't have as much power as it says, I am Jehovah, the God of you. That's the literal translation of these three words. Now we look at the second commandment. We're going to re read verse 3 through 6, but then we're just going to break it down to the Hebrew. You are to have no other gods before me. You are not to make for yourself a carved image of any kind, a representation of anything in heaven above or earth beneath or the, the water below, a shoreline. You are not to bow down to them or serve them, for I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but displaying grace to the thousandth generation of those who love me and obey my mitzvot. Amen? Now let's do that in Hebrew, in Ivrit. Lo yiye lacha elohim acherim al pane. I'm going to say that again in the Ivrit. Lo yiye lacha elohim acherim al pane. You shall have, you shall not have to you gods other beside my face. Panim. Don't have any other gods next to my face. So this is a lot stronger than what the English or some of the other languages have. That you should have no other gods next to my face. Nothing, he's saying, because then he goes on to say, I'm jealous. So if you have any other gods, anything next to his face, he's going to get angry. Okay, so he's showing ownership over us in the first commandment and in the second commandment he is now showing you I don't want to have anything next to my face it's very 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 important that we understand how strong the second commandment is now we're moving on to Gimel the third commandment you are not to use lightly the name of Adonai your God because Adonai will, will not leave unpunished someone who uses the name lightly so I'm going to read that in Hebrew because it reads a lot different. Lo tisa et shem Yehovah elachecha l'shav. I'm going to read that again. Lo tisa et shem Yehovah elachecha l'shav. You shall not take the name Yehovah, the God of you, for vanity. Okay? Don't take his name like. Don't say, OMG, OMG, OMG. You know, so many people do that, okay? Even though God is a, not, you know, the perfect translation, but it's many what we know of it. The Lord's saying, don't use it as vanity. So what, what first we need to look at, well, what is vanity? Okay, what is vanity? It's, you know, you know, you know ladies putting on makeup, or you're, you know, you're fussing about your appearance and things like that, you know, over the top type of thing, vanity. Or, uh, you want, uh, you know, your other things like that. All the things that are outside instead of inside can be determined as vanity. So don't take the name of Jehovah, the God of you, the ownership he's showing once again as vanity. Okay? This is how strong this third commandment is. You see how much more powerful in the Ivrit, in the Hebrew, that the commandments are. So when somebody wants to come to you with some other silly doctrines, you know, well, you say, well, is that in Scripture? Where's the chapter? Where's the verse? Let's read that verse plus the chapter and the chapter before and the chapter after. So we get a good understanding of what's going on there because the God who says, don't take my name as vanity, the one who's jealous, he owns us. And if we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Now, Let's move on to verse 8 through 11, the fourth commandment. Remember the day, Shabbat, to set it apart for God. You have six days to labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is a Shabbat for Adonai your God. On it, you are not to do any kind of work. Not you, your son, or your daughter, not your male, your female slave, not your livestock, not the foreigner staying with you inside your gates of your property. For six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. This is why Adonai blessed the day, Shabbat, and separated it for himself. Amen? Here, you're also seeing in the fourth commandment that it is for everybody. Okay? It's not just for the Jew. It's for the Gentile. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, like the Gentiles on Sunday, they go to church, and then they, they then go out to lunch. So are you making, are you making those people that you're going to lunch with work? The Shabbat is for everybody, and if we're the light. But let's, let's, let's read it in the Hebrew and see how much stronger. And remember the day the Sabbath set it apart for God. That doesn't really cut it. Zachor et yom hashabbat lakadosh. Zakor et yom hashabbat lakadosh. Remember the day of rest. Keep it holy. Amen? So keep it holy. Well, what does holiness mean to Jehovah? What does holiness mean to Jehovah? How do we separate that? How do we not let other things touch our our day, because it is a day the guy who owns us from the very first commandment to the other commandments, and that we saw there in number three, owning you again. Now it's he's saying to us, keep it kadosh. Well, what does it mean to be holy? Yeshua said, be holy, for I am holy. Okay? So if he's saying to keep the Shabbat holy, keep it separated, then we don't switch to another day because some person says to do so. Whether or not you think Paul says that, I don't care. Paul's not God. God is God, okay? Elohim is God. Jehovah is God. And he's saying, keep my day holy, okay? Moving on to number five, hey? Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in a land which Adonai your God is giving you. That's verse 12. Now, here it says in the Hebrew, kabed et avicha. Av 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 Honor the father of you and the mother of you. So here, once again, Jehovah is saying, they own you. I gave you to them. They own you. You've got to pay respect to me and your respect to your parents because you are property until you move on to another home. And then even then, you've still got to honor your father and mother. As long as they're believers and they're following in the footsteps of the Lord, even then, if they're not, honor them anyway. Okay? Pay respect to them because of the, the Father in heaven with the fifth commandment here is saying, honor Ima and Abba, father and mother, because they are the mother and father of you. Now moving on to ver, uh, number six, verse 13. Do not murder. Lo tirsach. Lo tirsach. You shall not murder. It doesn't say kill there. Okay, there is a difference in Ivrit, in Hebrew, between murder and killing. Okay, so like here in, in the Torah, in Vayikra, there is a thing about if somebody breaks into your home at night, you can kill them. Okay, because they may have a weapon and it is dark. But if that person breaks into your home during the day, you can't kill them. Then that would be murder. Okay? So here, the Lord says in the sixth commandment, do not murder. Lo tir sach. Okay? It's a very specific word. Now moving on to seven. Uh, do not commit adultery. Lo tinaf. Lo tinaf. You shall not commit adultery. There, and, we, and in the Torah, there is a lot of 
rules about adultery. If you're married and uh, you're a man and you go with another woman who's married, that's called adultery, and you get stoned to death. Okay? There are certain commandments that we break that require restitution. If you don't have the money, you got to pay it back, or you become a slave until it is paid back. But there are laws under God that require stoning because once this, this seed gets into the world, it becomes very bad. Now we go on to uh, number, uh, verse 15, uh, Chet, do not steal. Lo tig nov. Lo tig nov means you shall not steal. Not you shall steal. Okay? Something ain't yours, you can't take it. Okay? It's that simple. Do not steal. But you see, why would Jehovah then put it in the top 10? Not to say that number 40 isn't as important as number 10, but in one sense it is because these are the first ones. The, these are, these are, a lot of these are bigger headings. Like this is a heading, okay, of do not steal. And then there's da-da-da-da-da-da subheadings, okay, under that. But here, lo tignov, okay, do not steal. Number nine. Verse 16, do not give false evidence against your neighbor. Lo ta'ane vare acha ed shacher. Lo ta'ane vare acha ed shacher. You shall not bear against your neighbor witness of falsehoods. Okay? So I don't care how much somebody pays you. If you break this commandment, you're bearing false witness. If you have not seen something, you better speak up. If somebody says, uh, well, did you see this? Uh, well, I heard. No. If you, want, if you do that, stop. Because then it's lash and horror. Then it's gossip. So here, if you shall not bear against your neighbor, witness falsely. False witnesses. Okay? Do not bear false witness. So if you do not know it for a truth, then you must say so and then keep quiet. And then finally, number 10, verse 17. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Lo tachmod. Lo tachmod. You shall not covet. So when Yeshua said, if you even look at a woman in lust, you've already committed a sin, this is exactly what he was talking about, the 10th commandment, because you're coveting something that is not yours. Okay? Low talk mode. Do not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's things, your neighbor's wife, his slaves, nothing. If, it's not, if God didn't provide for you, don't covet what they got. Ask Father for it. Maybe he'll provide it if it's in his plan. Low talk mode. If you're a man and you're on the internet and you're doing, you're on the sites, websites that you shouldn't be, then you're coveting something that's not yours. Okay? It's that simple. So the Lord is saying, lo takmod, don't covet. All right? That has been a quick overview of this week's parash. I hope everybody's got stuff. If you want the PowerPoint, just let me know. We'll send you a copy of the PowerPoint. Okay? Amen and Amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, BethGoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, BethGoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the Donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnant's Call.
if you have not taken your first steps to be born again. Just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. That Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture. Truly, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend a day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our King's Word. We close this Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and Biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.